So thanks for, for having me here. And uh, it's great to be back at Workday. Uh, I think Workday was our first contact in the Bay Area when we started out with Scala and tried to look, reach out to industry. So it's really good to be back here now. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to do a quick poll here. Who here is actually a Scala developer? No Scala? OK, so basically everyone, right? Good, great. So my talk will be oriented to Scala developers so that we, we have the right match here. In fact, we, Scala is now 10 years old. We have an anniversary that year. Um, it came out. The first announcement was on 20th January 2004. And uh, it's interesting to look back and say, well, when we came out with Scala, what did we think? Uh, what, uh, what, what did we want to do? Of course, we would never have dreamed to have a language as big as that. Uh, but it's true that at the time, what I wanted to do is figure out whether we could combine functional and object-oriented programming and make it practical. That was my first uh, research agenda at the time, just to figure out whether it was possible. And then in the announcement says, well, that's essentially the points that we actually wanted to highlight. The first one said abstract types and mix in composition. They unify ideas of object and functional programming. So it plays in the modular, modular area here. Pattern matching over class hierarchies unifies functional and OOP. And it greatly simplifies the processing of XML trees. So XML trees were very important back then. That's probably something that we would revise nowadays. Uh, but at the time, XML was really extremely hot. Everybody wanted to do something with XML. And uh, for me, uh, the attraction of XML at the time was, you know, 2004, we were still in the time where object-oriented was the industry. There was nothing except object-oriented. That was the, the dogma. And the problem there is to say functional is different, because functional says, well, we have our data here and our methods, our functions over the data somewhere else. And we access it with pattern matching. And the object-oriented dogma said, no, you should not do that. This is completely wrong. You have to put the methods where the data is. You have to put them right in the data. And XML was so sort of the poster child of something where you say, you can't do that. That here, at least for XML, this approach is not possible because you can't put methods in XML trees. XML is pure data. So XML was sort of the thing, ah, finally, we can use pattern matching and functional methods for this sort of thing. And since XML would be important, we put it right in the language. And then number three was a flexible syntax and type system to enable the construction of advanced libraries and new domain-specific languages. And certainly, a lot has happened there in domain-specific languages. So it's interesting to see where we are and where, what, what the initial announcement was. Now, 10 years later, are we grown up? Well, Scala has definitely grown a lot. I think by conservative estimates, we have probably around 100,000 developers now worldwide. Uh, our Coursera courses on uh, principles of functional programming and reactive programming together got, I think, so far over 200,000 subscribers. And if you aggregate the Redmond rankings, that's Git, GitHub projects and Stack Overflow questions, then Scala is at number 13, which is actually quite respectable. But more than these numbers, I think the thing that matters most is that we have many, many, many successful rollouts and happy users. And that's fantastic. But Scala is actually also discussed probably more controversially than usual for a language in its stage of adoption. And the question is, why? Why, why, why is that? Why is Scala so controversial, even though a lot of people are really happy with Scala and, uh, and, 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 have, and are very successful with it? So I think part of the problem, or part of the situation, is that we have quite a few internal controversies. Different communities of the language don't agree what programming in Scala should be like. And then there are the external complaints, which go uh, all over the place, really. So that's, that's one you hear a lot. Scala is too academic. Uh, that one you hear also. Scala has sold out to industry. Uh, Scala's type are, types are too hard. It's pretty common. But some people think that Scala's types are actually not strict enough. And I guess a lot you hear Scala is everything and the kitchen sink. It's just so, so big and so huge. And that's actually the comment that vexes me most, because when I designed Scala, I wanted to do basically exactly the opposite. I wanted to do something that was very simple and very regular. And uh, I've been fighting a lot, uh, both in the message to say, well, how, how is it simple or complicated? And I've been fighting essentially in practice to keep it simple. So this talk is part of my mission here to say, well, I want to really 
figure out what are the simple parts of Scala. So this whole thing, I believe, is our science that we have not made clear enough what the essence of programming in Scala is. And that's what I will try to do in this talk. So pictures so far, uh, that's one where, that I've shown in almost all the talks I've ever given. So I said Scala is a unifier. It unifies object-oriented and functional programming. And that gives a language that is, at the same time, quite agile. You can use it as a scripting language. In fact, we have even won the script bowl one or two times at uh, uh, Java 1. And uh, at the same time, it's very safe and performant. It's sort of the backbone of a lot of services or the whole company. Companies like Workday or Twitter or Guild or many, many others bet on Scala, not just for the odd application, but for the infrastructure. Good. So Scala then, uh, as the name implies, is a scalable language. It does this to be scalable from scripting to massive uh, systems language. Scalable, you could ask, what is that? Well, the direct meaning of scalable would mean it's a growable language. It's a language that can be molded into new languages by adding libraries. And uh, these libraries could give new languages that are domain specific or general languages. And if you want to find out more what growable means, then I, the best uh, uh, talk to go to is really this talk by Guy Steele, Upsla, 1998, Growing a Language. It's an absolute piece of beauty. If you haven't seen that talk yet, then I can only warmly recommend that you look it up. The second meaning is, uh, of scalable is enabling growth. So not growable as a language itself, but the language would enable growable software can be used for small as well as large systems. And it allows for a smooth transition from small systems to large systems. And that's very important because I guess in many situations, large systems have started out small. And uh, there was no clear break in between. So Scala gives you essentially one feature set that works for small as well as large. And that's important for that. So let me go to the first meaning first, a growable language. So Scala definitely is a growable language. It has a flexible syntax, flexible types, user-definable operators, high-order functions, implicits. And all these things together make it relatively easy to build new domain-specific languages on top of Scala. In fact, I believe the original argument for Workday was precisely that, that we could do that, uh, that we could do a domain-specific language for Workday's application. And nowadays, where that fails, you can always turn to the macro system, where you have even more freedom than uh, with all these things, even though so far the macro system is labeled experimental, but so far that hasn't held many people back. And uh, what you, the, the, it's not only true in theory, but that really has panned out. There's now a large number of domain-specific languages or advanced libraries that run on top of Scala. I'll give you just uh, a small sample. So there's Chisel for hardware that's developed over at Berkeley. There's Spark, of course, for big data. Uh, there's Spray for HTTP dis dispatch. There are the Shapeless and Scala Z libraries for type-level programming. There are the database connections, Slick and Squirrel and several others. There are the testing frameworks like Specs and Scala Test. There's ACA for actors. There's SBT for the build tool. All these uh, tools or libraries, they are really domain-specific languages on top of Scala. So you could say this growth strategy has really worked well. But is growable always good? In fact, you could argue it's a double-edged sword because uh, the Domain-specific languages actually have often the effect that they fracture the user community. There's a famous essay, The Lisp Curse, uh, about another language that is very growable and that has suffered from this problem to some degree. The problem is it's, if it's too easy to make new languages on top of a host language, then everybody will do it and you end up with a lot of different dialects and those dialects will have uh, problems talking to each other or the people using the different dialects will have problems understanding each other. Besides, no language is liked by everyone, no matter whether it's a DSL or a general purpose language. And that means that even if you do a DSL and you find it fantastic on top of Scala, not all Scala users might agree with you, never mind all the other users out there. And finally, uh, host languages do get some of the blame for the DSLs they embed. So all this is sort of a double-edged sword. Growable is good, but um, uh, there are problems with it. 
it's great for experimentation, definitely, but for production use, it demands a lot of discipline to achieve conformity. It demands agreement between the partners in a team or between different teams in conformity. So that was the global aspect. The second aspect was a language for growth. And I think that's all true, also true for Scala because one can start with a one-liner in the REPL or in the worksheet. One can experiment quickly. And one can grow with all, without falling off the cliff. The language stays with you. The same constructs stay with you. And of course, that has worked out also well. From very small beginnings, Scala deployments now go into the millions of lines of code. Uh, the language works for very large problem programs. It's true that the tools are challenged. Uh, the larger the code bases, the more pressure you have on the build times. And that's definitely one of the priorities where we work very hard to improve that. In the 2.11 version of Scala that just got released, we have drastically improved incremental build times. And hopefully down the road, we will also have some progress to report on the, on the uh, clean build times. A large system, and definitely we have large systems in Scala now, by the way. A good quote that I heard for that is, a large system is one where you do not know, they do not even know that some of its components exist. So what enables this sort of growth in Scala? Well, I believe it is the combination of object-oriented and functional. And if I look at uh, what I can see of the large systems out there, then they definitely do use both aspects. They are predominantly functional. Uh, I think every, all, most of the successful large rollout of Scala are predominantly functional. But they also make good use and extensive use of the object-oriented capabilities to structure these large systems into objects, classes, traits, and so on. Unfortunately, there's no established term for this combination of object-oriented and functional. Some people have proposed object functional, but I don't like these hybrid names. They uh, remind me too much of PL1. Besides, uh, we are in a difficult spot here because while we would prefer things to be like this, watch the sunset in perfect harmony, uh, unfortunately, it's not often uh, like this. It's more often like this. That, that's how functional people often see OOP. And that's how object-oriented people often see functional the mad scientist who's at best crazy and at worst dangerous. And unfortunately, the Scala community often finds itself between the two chairs in the middle, universally loathed by both sides. So that's where we are. Um, another quote here which, which plays uh, in, in the same direction is uh, James Irie from A Brief, Incomplete, and Mostly Wrong History of Programming Languages. If you haven't read it yet, I can recommend it. It's hilarious. So what he wrote here is 2003, a drunken Martin Odersky sees a Reese peanut butter cup ad featuring somebody's peanut butter getting on somebody else's chocolate and has an idea. <laughs> <coughs> he creates Scala, a language that unifies constructs from both object-oriented and functional lang languages. This pisses off both groups, and each promptly declares jihad. <laughs> Amazingly prescient, no? I, I wouldn't would have thought. He, I think he wrote that in 2011. But the definitely, this jihad bit has, quite, has evolved quite well since then. So yeah. So object functional is a difficult spot because the two communities they don't really understand each other. Sometimes they even say there can't be a compromise. You can't merge the two, even though I believe we have successfully demonstrated that you can. And what you need to do all the time is overcome this misunderstanding. And that's sort of an unproductive thing. So what I'd like to do here is to say, well, let's shift the viewpoint a little bit and say, well, what is it, this combination of object and functional that is special about it? And I would like to propose that the word modular for that. So Scala is a modular language. It unifies object-oriented and functional to be a language where you can go from small scripts to large systems. And the idea is modularity. So what is modular programming? Well, if you look it up, then modular programming, you compose your programs from modules. And what are modules? Well, the best definition that I've seen is a module should be a simple part that can be combined in many flexible ways to give interesting results. Simple parts that can be combined in many ways. Think Lego bricks. That's one, one good example of a module out there. And simple usually means that it encapsulates only one functionality. 
But you could say, well, that's old hat. Should we go back to modular too? That was a language that uh, uh, used this term modular programming. I see two thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. Well, the four thumbs up. Uh, I'm 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 one of the the crowds who actually started with modular two to do serious programming, and I I really very much liked the language when it was there. But that was the early 80s, so or mid 80s. So should we all go back? Well, of course not. Uh, the early 80s were quite different from now. In particular, programs were were much smaller, and they were more constrained to the so-called von Neumann paradigm. That means your program consisted essentially of variables that modeled memory cells, and then there was a process, and there was a bus of a single width. And that the programming languages were like that. They were speaking to the store variable by variable and pointer by pointer. You did this piecewise bit of modification. Now, if you want to scale that, then I say you, you say you don't want to talk about pointers or ints. You want to talk about things like graphs and uh, customers and polygons and polynomials and things like that. And if you do that, you need a theory for these things. And the, if you look at theories of polynomials or polygons or graphs, then they are functional. That uh, functional says, well, for instance, if I have two strings and I add them, I will, of course, get a new string, which is the concatenation of the two strings. I won't like, mathematics doesn't tell me, well, if I, I can change the third character of the string and it's still the same string. No, no, it's a different string, right? It's obvious, you could say. But of course, the old programming languages were not like that. That argument that I've just made was made by John Backus, who's uh, the inventor of arguably the first high-level von Neumann language that's called Fortran. And when John Backus got the Turing Award, the highest award in computer science, he gave a speech where he said, well, essentially, Fortran is no longer the right way to go about things. It's functional programming. That was, in a sense, the start of modern functional programming in the late 70s. And the other paper that is very interesting is uh, from John Hughes, uh, Why Functional Programming Matters. I don't know who has read that paper at some point. Quite a few. So if you have read that paper, then you will be with me to say, well, that's essentially a modularity argument. In that paper, John Hughes takes an algorithm, which is essentially a loop, where you mangle the, 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 the loop and the termination condition and the iteration step and the, the rounding. And uh, he essentially splits apart the individual things into functions by themselves and, co and recomposes them and says, well, that's much more modular because what was essentially all mangled together, meshed together in one loop, I now have as, uh, have as separate functions. OK, so functional is definitely good for modular programming, uh, but it's not synonymous. So it, functional does not imply modular necessarily. There's some pros concepts in functional languages that can be at odds with modularity. So for instance, anything that assumes a global namespace, like Haskell's type classes, wouldn't be very modular. In, in a Haskell type class, you can in, in implement a given class only once with a given instance type for the whole program. Now, uh, if you, uh, I just said a large system is one where you don't even know that certain components exist. So that would be bad news for type class implementations, because in some components that you don't even know exists, you might have an instance definition that conflicts with yours. And then your program wouldn't compile anymore and or wouldn't run anymore. And there are several other things as well that you can argue about. Object-oriented languages are, in a sense, the successor of the classical modular languages. But object-oriented does not fully imply modular either. So there are things, for instance, like monkey patching in Ruby, which also suffer from this globality problem. So you can essentially uh, add a method to the root class object, but you can do it only, of course, only once. If somebody else added a method with the same name, you get a conflict and you have problems. Not exactly modular. Besides, uh, object-oriented programming often relies too much on mutable state. And that gives hidden dependencies between modules that uh, uh, makes composition difficult. And there are fairly weak facilities for composition and decomposition. Compos decomposition facilities means that you typically have to rely on external dependency injection frameworks to get anything done. And that, for me, is a weakness of the language itself. If you require something else to do something as fundamental as dependency injection, then obviously the languages themselves haven't done, done enough for you uh, to, to, to satisfy you here. OK. So Scala then, before I discuss the, par the parts that are more, have more to do about modules, I just want to start with the simple parts in the language itself. So what are the simple parts that can be combined freely? 
And in fact, I've thought a bit, and I think they, these parts correspond to the fundamental actions that programmers, when they write programs in Scala, do every day. And those actions are the ones that you see here, and we will go, go through them bit by bit. So each one of these actions corresponds to one language construct that supports it. And as always, just a caveat that simple is not easy. That means for some people, uh, these things might look easy. That means familiar. For other people, it might look strange. But that doesn't say whether the thing is simple or not. Simple means one functionality can be combined well with other. Easy means it's familiar. It's close to what you already know. And the two, of course, are not necessarily the same. OK, so action number one, what we do is compose. We compose a program from parts, and that is made in Scala, very easy because everything is an expression. And expressions are composable. Uh, you can put an expression as the operand of an operation, as the argument as a function, as the condition of an if, as the body of a try, and so on. And that's, of course, helped by the fact that all the things that would be statements in one of the more mainstream languages are expressions in Scala. So the if-else is an expression produces a result, so is the match, the analog of the switch in C or Java, so is the try. And that means that you can put everything inside everything else at complete freedom. And you don't need to drop out and essentially have statements that you write one after the other and that are then connected with mutable variables. So that's the number one thing, which is often overlooked. It's completely trivial. But I think the fact that you have that is very liberating in the way you can write your programs. You can refactor your programs, because it just means you have this complete general concepts of comp composability. OK, so the dual of compose is decompose, or I call that match. So when you compose data, some, often you also want to take them apart. You want to find out, well, what do you have? What have you composed? What's the structure of this thing? And act accordingly. And that's in Scala done through pattern matching. Again, a functional feature that typically functional languages have. Um, and that's a dual of composition. So here's a classical example of pattern matching. I guess you've seen many like that. Uh, we have a, <coughs> the structure of uh, ar arithmetic expressions. So there would be a trait expression. And then there would be two case classes, one for numbers and one for plus uh, op operations that both are expressions. And then somewhere else, we can write a function like eval, which takes an expression tree and gives the uh, integer that it evaluates to. And that, of course, would be a match, which says, well, if it's a number with uh, the a value n, then that's the value of the expression. If it's a plus with the operands island, island r, then evaluate both operands and sum them. Completely trivial. So that's a very simple and flexible way to go about things. Uh, uh, pure functional programming people coming from Haskell or uh, Camel, say, would sometimes criticize that this is a bit verbose. And that's true compared to uh, the algebraic data types that you find in these languages. This thing is a, is a little bit longer. On the other hand, uh, to, to say in, 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 in Scala side of the argument, uh, we don't need a separate type. So these are just class hierarchies, like other classes as well. So that's more uniform. And it's also more flexible. It turns out that with the subtleties of type parameters or, or other things in Haskell or Camel, you sometimes have to use a different syntax to achieve something which is all uh, the same here. And by the way, and besides uh, the uh, how, how big is the part, uh, how big a part of your program would be played by these uh, data type definitions. Normally, uh, probably is a tiny percentage, 1%, maybe 5% max, or something like that. So whether you spend a little bit of verbosity here or not, it's, for, for me, it doesn't really matter in real systems. Good, so that was sort of the functional approach to these things. I think it's worthwhile to actually look at the traditional object-oriented alternative that you can also do in Scala. So that would be the traditional object-oriented alternative. You have the trait expression. And now the eval method would be right in the trait, but it would be abstract here. And there would be implementations. Eval equals n in the case, in the number case, and that summation in the plus case. So that's two ways to express the same thing. And that way to go about is OK 
if there are only a few operations and the operations are fixed. And it's even the recommended way to go uh, about things if there are a variable number of cases. So if what your future growth of the system would consist to add, add actually new expression variants and the number of methods that you have in expression stays fixed, then that's the right way to go about things because to add a new variant, all you have to do is add a new subclass and you don't have to touch everything else. Whereas previously, to add a new variant, you'd have to touch your cases here, add a new case to every switch. On the other hand, in a lot of cases, you don't have this situation. You have the situation where the data is relatively stable and fixed, but what, what you want to do with it might vary widely. So think about the data being an interchange format or a, a, uh, a database schema or something like that. Uh, these things are normally given and they last a long time. But what, what you want to do with the data might change every day. So in that case, I would say that the functional approach to say, keep the business logic and the data separate is definitely the better approach. Scala, some people sometimes think that Scala is confusing because it offers both approaches. And uh, my only answer there is, well, there are problems that demand both solutions. And uh, I sort of appeal to you as the engineers to actually make the trade-offs and pick the right one. Uh, but uh, of course, it would be simpler to just shrink wrap one and just force it down you and declare that this is the best way to go about things always, which unfortunately isn't true. OK, so that was number two, match. Number three, I would say, is grouping. So the idea is that everything can be grouped and nested inside each other. And there's a static scoping discipline. And that, again, is uniform. It's the same thing for everything, whether it's a term or a type. Both have exactly the same scope rules. And you can nest everything inside every, everything. So here, of course, you have a little program where you have a, a predicate is solution, which is a method. And then you filter over that. And the is solution method is right in the solutions method. In Java, of course, you couldn't do that. You can't nest a method inside a method. On the other hand, you can nest a class inside a method and then a method inside the inner class. So you can nest methods inside methods if there's a class in the middle, but not directly. Why? Don't ask me why. Good. <laughs> so the idea here is that this grouping principle is actually very important because it prevents or it helps people from avoiding a rookie mistake that one often does when one is new to functional programming. So the rookie mistake is just to pack too much in an expression. To say, well, because I can compose so well, I can put all these things in my expression, uh, I will do it and I will end up with expressions that are positively huge. So that's the thing that I actually found in our own code base. So we definitely are as guilty as everyone of this thing. So it's a very impressive piece of code. It achieves a lot. Quite amazing what you can achieve in a single expression. But it doesn't mean you have to do it. So my tip here is to say, probably, if people want advice, how can I improve my code base? How can I sort of do the right way to go about Scala? Here's the tip that I think has the most impact. Find meaningful names. So make sure that every intermediate result of your program has a meaningful name. If there's too much, uh, or if you can't find meaningful names for these things, then it's probably a code smell. It might mean that your abstractions are actually wrong. If you can't say what it is and communicate what it is, then it's probably wrong. So what I did with this simple ex with this expression that you've seen, I tried to find meaningful names. And I believe the refactoring it got slightly longer, but it, it also got uh, clearer. So we're talking here about some sources. Uh, it, it's in a compiler. So these are compiler sources. There's a workspace root. There's a method that gives you for an entry the sets of files that correspond to it. And then the find the expression as a whole. It takes the sources, and it for each source, it uh, uh, determines the files that correspond to the entry, and it concatenates them all. So OK, so now we're in business. Now we understand what this thing is. And of course, I can put that in braces and make this an expression. Uh, 
I don't have to, but I don't have to trade off the fact that I have these intermediate results, which are now well named, with the fact that I have to put them maybe in the enclosing class and have confusing things in the enclosing class scope. I can pick the natural scope where these things are, and that I think makes the advice more powerful because there's now no downside to create things that have new names. So number three, that was a nest group. Number four would be recurse. So in functional programming, of course, uh, Recursion is everywhere. Um, recursion lets us compose to arbitrary depths. That's why it's important. Without recursion, your, 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 the depth in which you could compose expression is always finite. And recursion is, I believe, in a functional program, almost always better than a loop, in particular because you can make it just as fast as a loop. That's the other nice thing. Because uh, there is a thing called tail recursion. And if a function is tail recursive, then it is, uh, for all intents of purposes, implemented just as well as the fastest loop you, you, you could write. And you can verify that a function is tail recursive by just adding this tail rec annotation to it. For me, that's actually a very useful fallback. Uh, it's true that if you approach functional programming, then often the nicer way to express yourself is with combinator libraries. You use map, flat map, filter, collect, uh, things like that, and you combine them all. And in fact, that's the right way to go about if, you're pro if it fits your problem well. But there's always a time when sometimes you run out of operators, you run out of combinators, your problem doesn't really correspond to any combination of these things or any, any natural combination of these things. And there are sometimes also times where you need to be sure you have squeezed out the last cycle of performance of your program. And in both of these cases, this recursion and is actually a very good fallback. So tail recursive functions can essentially implement arbitrary state machines very, very efficiently. So they, it's good to have that in the back pocket, so to speak, to say, well, if I must, if my, if my combinators are not good, that for me is the fallback uh, where I know that I can always go back to that and do something that works and is efficient, even though it might be less elegant and sometimes longer than the combinator approach. Well, speaking of combinators, <coughs> that they are, of course, also very important. And the combinators, in particular, are very powerful because they let me abstract computations into values. So I can have a, a method like filter. It takes a parameter of what I want to do. So I abstract out the operation with which I filter into a function value. And function values, of course, are very important, are the backbone of functional languages. And by now, they're so common that basically every language has them, except of a few holdouts, uh, which, uh, which are uh, the minority of even mainstream languages. Almost all languages have them. Java 8 has now even function values. And, uh, and that's a good thing. I think it's, it's excellent that we can agree on that now, everybody. So number six would be aggregate. So uh, if you have data, then of course we want to have some way to treat these data, put these data, treat these data collectively, put them in a collection. And the importance in the functional world is that once we have these collections, we want to transform them. We don't want to do create, read, update, delete because that's imperative. That's really element by element. So the essence of functional programming is transform immutable data and do the same thing for collections. And these transformations are particularly pleasant, I believe, in Scala because they're very uniform. So there's a rather large but uniform sets of operators that lets you transform collections. And because they're uniform, these operators, they're the same for every collection, they end up being rather easy to use because uh, you can transfer the knowledge that you know from one collection, let's say from lists, to another collection, you can go from lists to arrays or to sets or to some distributed maps and so on. It always it's the same operators that apply. It's a very powerful principle. So what, what you have here is just a little worksheet work transcript. I don't know whether it's so legible. So uh, you have here an array of persons. And then you can map with a function underscore dot name over the persons. You get the names of these persons in the array. But you can also map over a set. In this case, we map with the division by two operator. And the new set will then have one element less than the original set. So that tells you that no sets are not sequences. They behave differently, of course, because you eliminate duplicate. But 
they both have a map. And map does a natural thing, both for sequences and sets. And even maps have a map. So here you have a map over a map that uh, inverts the original map. So you can do lots of stuff. And that's not just for the basic types, but it also works in sequential and in parallel. And it works on a single computer, or it works on a distributed system using a, a software such as Spark. OK, so I believe actually collections are a big argument in favor of Scala. They work very, very well. But not everybody agrees with that. So I thought I would just uh, respond a little bit to the collections, to the objections that you have heard sometimes on collections. So one argument that uh, you hear sometimes is that, that people say the type of map is ugly or a lie. Well, uh, to explain that, let's look up the Scala doc, so the docu official documentation of maps. And here I look, the, look up the one for arrays. So here's, here's what I see. So a map takes a type parameter, b, and a function from a to b, and it gives you back an array of b. Looks, looks reasonable, right? Um, but there's this ominous thing which says use case. So what this does says is, in principle, if I am a client of an array, then that's the type I need to know. That's how arrays work from, for me as a client perspective. But what actually happens is that if you look up the implementation of map, you won't find it on array. You will find it in a much more general space where it works for all collections. And that's very important because uh, we introduced the scheme in Scala 2.8 uh, four years back, five years back. Uh, what's important is that before every collection had their own map or their own implementations. And that led to a lot of discrepancies, discrepancy creep between collections. Because uh, some of these implementations might have been buggy, others were correct. So the more implementations you have, the more, the more uh, scope is there for errors to creep in. And what's more, than, they might have sub subtly different semantics. For instance, there could have been a take where one implementation would just truncate the, the, the argument. If you take more elements than the collection is, is, is long, it would just reduce and take the whole collection. The other implementation would be different and maybe throw an exception. So you had, and furthermore, you even would have sometimes one operation like append on one collection, and on the other collection it was called concat. And these are all these things which are friction. These make things hard to use. You don't have the same operations. The operations have subtly different meaning. That's the last thing you want to have. So what we decided would be much better is if there was a single implementation of single reference implementation of every method you have in collection. Sometimes that reference implementation is overwritten in particular collections for performance, and that's OK. But there should be a single fallback, a single reference implementation. Now, if you look up that type, then uh, you get this uh, type down here. And uh, it, was a, uh, that it, it does indeed look pretty horrible. So it now has two type parameters, b and that. And uh, here's the function that goes from t to b. And then there's this implicit parameter, which is called a can build from. And uh, it says, well, if you have an array of t and an element type b, and you can build a type of, a, type of a, a collection of type that, then that's what you return. Yeah, that's, that's complicated. And uh, I guess uh, the good, good point is that Almost no programmer ever sees this thing until they look, because uh, that's something that is very carefully hidden in the compiler. But you could ask, well, why, why is, does it have to be so complicated? Why can't we do it like this? Uh, so in, in a sense, you could say things that have maps are functors. And one idea to treat that would be to say, well, here's a functor, and it has an a higher kind of type f and an element type t, and then map would just uh, go from uh, take a function from t to u and give you back the same functor, but on a new element type u. And in fact, when I started to work on the new collection designs, the reason why I did that, the reason why I started at all, was that Scala had higher kind of types. So I thought I could do something like this, and it would be fantastic. It would, would be great. That was the otherwise I would never have got, gotten into collections. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Why does it not work? Well, think about arrays. So uh, in arrays, if you have a type of map, if you want to build a new array, what do we have to do? We have to, give, we have to provide a class tag, because the JVM 
demands that for arrays to build an, an object of, of an array, I have to know the element type statically. I have to put that in a class tag. And there's no way I could put a class tag in the signature. It doesn't let me add a class tag. It's too pure for that. And it turns out that the class tags for arrays are just one example. There are many others. Uh, for instance, for an ordered set, I'd need a comparison operation to essentially eliminate the duplicate and order, order well. And other collections have similar constraints that uh, say, well, in addition to the pure type of map, I need to know something else. And these need to know something else that's precisely what's always encapsulated and they can build from. So now you know why there is can build from and why it's necessary to make it make a collection system that is very, very general. Uh, if we didn't do that, then essentially we would have a collection that a system that only worked with a very, very small subsets of, 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 of collections that uh, for the end user would be weird to say, well, why can't I have ordered sets? Why can't I have arrays? Why are these things not collections? They should be. And I think that's, we, we just have to work a little bit harder to make them collections. Okay. So the other collection I just, uh, the other uh, objection maybe I just, Skip, uh, you can ask me afterwards if you want to, and then I will talk about that. So number seven in the um, uh, list of things to do with uh, programs is mutate. And I put it as last because I think it's the one we should be most careful about, but we shouldn't uh, forget about it altogether. So mutating uh, variables is something which is an essential part of programming. And uh, what I would recommend is that we minimize that. But I I'm not recommend that we forget about that, that we don't use it at all. Because while global state can often heat to lead to hidden dependencies, and that's not good, it can also cut down on boilerplate and increase efficiency and clarity when it's used widely. So what I did is I took a uh, a survey of uh, the code that I wrote uh, recently in uh, the new compiler project that I did and said, well, where does that use mutable state? <clears throat> and in fact, it's uh, done uh, pretty carefully. So uh, where it does use mutable state are for these five uh, uh, purposes, uh, where essentially three of them are uh, only optimizations. So the idea is what we want to do is we want to write a compiler that is very functional, that has a predominantly functional architecture. And then we want to make it very, very fast, hopefully much faster than the current Scala-C compiler. So how do you make a purely functional program or almost purely functional program very, very fast? Well, you have to pull some tricks. So one trick you can pull is very aggressive caching. That's something that essentially functional programs give you. Uh, you have a function, and the function will give you the same result every time you apply it to the same arguments. Now, if the function gets applied repeatedly to the same arguments and the function is expensive to compute, you might actually be better off by caching the first application of the function result and then reusing that result later on. And, but caching, of course, is an art. So you can't rely on just a built-in thing in the language. In fact, if I look at what the compiler does, we have a large number of different forms of caches. There are the lazy valves that the language provides, but there are also memoized functions that are backed by a hash map or weak hash map. There are interned names, and then there are even LRU caches because we need to bound the size of the cache. So that's, uh, the, 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 that's caches of size um, 8 or 16 that essentially hit the last 16 uh, member calls on a given type and return you one if, if it's one of the, the, the last 16. So caching is an art, and it requires the application of mutable state in a clever way. But caching done well is not visible for the clients of the thing. So the compiler would, uh, would run just as well, albeit much more slowly, if it turned off all the caches. In fact, we have an option to turn off the caches and verify that fact. Uh, then there's persisting. So once a value in a map is stable, uh, we can actually transfer it as a, into a field of the object itself that would clear the value out in the map and therefore essentially, again, uh, avoid memory leaks and improve the access time to that value. We do that uh, at, at, at one point in the compiler when we talk about the instance of a, of a type variable. Once the instance is determined, we can put it right in the type variable. Then there's, there's a trick on copy on write uh, where we say we, we have trees and the uh, syntax trees, again, they're purely functional. But under the cover, they have essentially a field for the types. 
and you essentially you have one write free. You can use, reuse the same uh, immutable untyped tree, and you can put one type in there, but then you come back and says, well, this untyped tree in the new context has a different type, and you can't, of course, overwrite. You have to essentially copy and write the tree. And finally, you have fresh values where you have to generate in a compiler often fresh names, so a unique ID or a unique, unique name or things like that. And of course, for that, you have a global counter and you bump it up every time you need a new, new name. That's what everybody does. So what I'm saying here is all these four things are really your use state, but for the users of your program, it's not really visible. Except for the last point, unique values, you can argue about that. It is visible, but it's generally, uh, it doesn't matter what, what name it is, so it doesn't, so, so, so you don't need to do it purely functional. And if you do all that, then the compiler actually was left with two variables. Uh, one that kept the current constraint, where the constraint is again an immutable object, and one which kept the current diagnostics, which is essentially the error log. And those two uh, variables, uh, we have to version them. Uh, that means they, they, there's actually a sort of backtrack search where you, they could, be, could have different things and you, you need to be able to backtrack and, um, and keep uh, multiple versions of these things around. Okay, so now you could say, well, essentially typing means um, um, here's a function typed, uh, so it uh, takes an untyped tree and an expected type and gives you back a type tree. But in addition, it also might manipulate these two variables under the cover. Namely, the, uh, it might add to the constraint and it might produce errors. And here's another method, is subtype, that uh, checks whether one type is a subtype of the other. But again, in doing so, it might add to your constraint set. That's essentially an implicit uh, documentation that you say it can do these things. So if I were completely pure, I would say at this point, well, for these things, you should use a monad, right? Who here knows, what, knows not what monads are? Everybody, excellent. Okay, so a monad is uh, essentially a thing where we say, well, where I have this result type tree here, here I wrap the type tree in something I call a type of state. So I say, I return a type of state, that's these two pieces of state, the constraint the, the, and, the, and the log, and I pair it with my actual result, the type tree. And I do the same thing with the subtype. So that would be the pure approach to functional programming, which says we shouldn't have state, you should, or if you have state, then you should simulate it with these monads. Uh, but if you, if you look at the use, usage examples, then what was this would become that. So here's this very simple line which says, says uh, if T1 is a subtype of T2 and T2 is a subtype of T3, then return some result. If uh, is subtype returned not a Boolean, but a type of state of Boolean, of course you can't do that. What you would have to do is use a for expression or a series of flat maps, which is the same thing. So the for expression would read like this, it would say, well, if for C1 taken from the result is subtype T1, T2. C2 taken from the result is subtype T2, T3. If the condition C1 and C2 is true, then yield the result. So there's a systematic way to, come to essentially convert the functional programs into this monadic world. But you have to ask yourself, have we really achieved something that way? Is that really better? It sure is longer. It's probably less efficient too. So, so what, what have we achieved with that? So for me, actually, uh, the important part of this thing was that by thinking really functionally, we have reduced the essential state to two vars. That, that's, that's, that's the big thing. That, and I think that's the thing that we tr should try to, to, to achieve. Think very carefully about the state, minimize it to the absolute essential bits. Whether then, with the remaining state, we actually have a type that reflects that state, as in monads, or we leave that essentially implicit, is a secondary concern. That's a concern where we essentially we have a trade-off, uh, a trade-off that we can make in either directions. And in the compiler, definitely the, the trade-off is against the monads because essentially it's pretty clear what kind of operations affect what kind of state. Uh, essentially, everything in the typer can produce errors and uh, add to the, uh, to the constraint set and everything in subtyping can, can add to the constraint set and that's it. So what I think here is that these trade-offs, these typing questions are really more pragmatic than fundamental. So here, here are five fine programming languages 
And in a sense, none of them is right in their approach to typing. And that means that essentially everybody is, 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 is correct. So if I program in a language like Clojure, I don't care about types at all. All I want the compiler to do is check my syntax. And I said, the, the types are implicit. If I program in a language like Scala, then I have a more traditional approach to static typing. So the types verify what goes into my functions, what comes out of them, and maybe the, the types of variables as well. If I have a language like Haskell, then in addition to that, I let my types track my effects, like the type of state. Uh, if I have a language like Idris, then in addition, my types actually tell me even more about my values, if two values are equal or if certain predicates hold about my value. That's the dependently type programming languages. And if I have a language like Coq, then essentially my types give me a total correctness proof of my program, which is, would, is of course the best only that, except that it's very, very hard to achieve. You have to work really hard to get that far. Uh, so what, I, what I'm saying is in that spectrum, the question what you subject to types is one which is pretty pragmatic and there's no right answer. Because if there was a right answer, you would say, well, four of these languages got it wrong. And I think that would be, <laughs> that would be too presumptuous to, do, to, to, to say that. So all I'm saying is it's all a question of trade-offs. Good. So to summarize the Simple parts that I have identified in Scala, they, are each, they each come essentially from a fundamental action. We compose expressions, we nest scopes, we match with patterns, we recurse with recursive functions, we abstract functions into values, we aggregate collections, and we, we mutate variables. That, for me, is it. And if I look at my code, then I say, well, that's basically it. There may be some odds and ends, like lazy vowels that hang here and there. But they're not essential to the core of programming. That's essentially what, what it's about. Except then, of course, with these simple parts, you build modules. So let me ju just finish in talking a little bit about that. So what is a module? Well, actually, a module can take a really large number of forms. A module can be just a single function. A uh, module can be an object. A module can be a class, so an object that gets parameterized, an actor, a string transform, or a microservice, or any of probably more uh, instances. The importance of a module is that the focus is on how a module can be combined with others, and not so much on what, what, what it does in isolation. So that's what makes a module. A module is something that can be combined well. And what's important is that since Scala is a statically typed language, in Scala, these modules, they need to talk about values, but also about types, because a type is an essential part of the interface. OK, so let me just skip that in the interest of time. So the features that Scala has for modular programming is, I think, first, uh, we need a vocabulary what goes in and out of a module. And there, I think, it's precisely the rich types with static type checking and functional semantics that we have talked about so far, that we can build up these types with case classes, that we can work with them functionally, that we have a functional theory on these things. Um, then the next thing is uh, pretty mundane. We, the simplest form of modules are objects. So an object is just something which is a container for functionality. Uh, methods, typically. Uh, we can parameterize these objects, uh, then they become classes. So once an object takes parameters, it becomes a class. And we can create an arbitrary number of instances of these things. So that's sometimes useful if your module is just not a unique thing. So what you want, essentially, a dynamically varying number of them. And finally, traits, that's essentially a mix in another dimension. So a trace is essentially a slice of behavior that exists to be mixed in in some other behavior. So you have classes and traits, which is essentially parameterization and uh, mixing slices. That's number four. So I was going quickly. For the rest, I'm going a bit more slowly. So the next thing is abstraction. So abstraction means uh, taking a concept and giving it some name and afterwards using only the name. And the direct form of abstraction is directly by name. object oriented programming gives us that. So we can actually have in a trait or in a class things which we, which, to which we give a name, but not an implementation, what they mean. And uh, because modules in Scala talk about types as well as values, we can do that for types as well as methods or fields. So here is an example uh, where we uh, treat a problem which is uh, pretty hard to do in general 
and that's how to write a library for graphs uh, without over committing ourselves at any point to some particular form of graph, whether it's labeled or weighted or whatnot, uh, and to any particular implementation of graphs, whether we do that with a, a matrix or a, an edge list or something else. So what I start with here is to say, well, I have a trait graphs, and it has nodes and edges. And I don't know what nodes and edges are, but uh, I know that there's a type of nodes and there's a type of edges. That's all I write here. I don't need to write more. The other thing I, I, I know is that I, there is a, a function predecessor that takes an edge and gives you its node. And there's a function successor that does, does the same thing. And then I have a graph uh, over these given alphabet of nodes and edges. And um, a graph is a, um, a but type where I know that it co conforms to this graph signature. I say, well, what's in a graph? Uh, a graph has a set of nodes, a set of edges. For each node, there's a set of outgoing edges. For each node, there's a set of incoming edges. And there's a set of sources. But I could say these two are fundamental. That's what defines a graph. And these three here are, in a sense, utility methods that are very useful to have on graphs. OK, so so far, it's pure interface. There's not a single bit of implementation ever, anywhere. I just told you, essentially, what's the vocabulary when we talk about graphs. There are things that are nodes and edges, and how do they hang together, and uh, what, what, do I, what operations do I choose to have in a graph. OK, so let's work on the graph thing. thing. So independently of what our nodes and edges is, we can give you a possible implementation of a graph. And here, the implementation is the most concise possible, and that probably also makes it the most ineff inefficient one possible. So here, the graph just would get the nodes and edges as two sets as parameters. And then the outgoing edges of a given node, it's just I go through all the edges. And I filter out those edges that have the node as the predecessor. The incoming edges, I filter all edges uh, the, to, to those that have the node as their successor. And the sources, I filter all the nodes that don't have any incoming edge. That's the sources of the graph. OK, so what's interesting here is that we can, at any point, define what we know and leave abstract what we don't. So here, we've, what we have defined now is this thing, graph, which so far was just a promise. We said, well, there is a type that satisfies these methods. And here we have said, well, here it is. That's the class graph that we, that, 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 that we produce here. But on the other hand, here we don't really know yet what nodes or edges are. So we just leave them open. It's completely OK in this uh, object-oriented class-based approach to just say, well, if you don't know something, leave it abstract. OK, so finally, here we actually give a concrete implementation. Let's say the graph is a social graph. So my nodes are some persons. And it's a simple social graph. So my edges are just pairs of persons, and they don't have a weight or something else. So it's just this thing here, these two de type definitions. And then I also need to implement these two methods, the successor and predecessor methods. And I'm done. So then now I can mod mix the concrete model that explains what the nodes and edges are with my abstract graph model. And I have something which is a complete application. So what's interesting in here is that uh, they're actually Two things that are two sides of the coin that are, in a sense, exactly the same thing, namely encapsulation and parameterization. And that's rather surprising. So if I look at the first example here, you could say that's an example of encapsulation. I've, I'm hiding the type of nodes from you and the type of edges. You, as a user of graphs here out on this level, I don't know what nodes and edges are. So that's a sign of encapsulation. I can't mess with the internals of node and, node, nodes and edges. On this level here, I know what they are, but that, that's the implementation level of the graph. And the, at the same time, by these definitions, I parameterize the abstraction. So I provide the actual argument for the abstract node and, and, and uh, edge parameter. So parameterizing an abstraction using this by name overriding and encapsulation are two sides of the coin depending on where I look at, whether I look at the abstract class or the concrete implementation. OK, so that was this name-based abstraction. But there's another one, and that's by position. And that's much better known normally. 
that's just plain parameterization. So here I just look at the types. So of course in Scala we can parameterize classes and traits. So we have the class list of t and set of t. And then we have this uh, uh, thing called variance that some of the parameterizations are covariant and others are invariant and others are, yet others are contravariants. So that's sort of something that often people find more complicated. So when, I, when my son was first um, looking at Scala and reading the programming Scala book, he found that very easy. So one chapter after another, no problem, no problem, until he got to variance. This is really weird. This is a weird thing in Scala. And I had to sort of <laughs> explain to him why, why that is. And it is something that trips up a lot of people. So what variance, of course, does is it says, well, if I have a list of apples, is that a subtype of a list of fruit? And here the answer is yes, a list of apples is a subtype of a list of fruit because I've written this plus here. The plus makes a list of apples a subtype of list of fruit. For set, I have chosen to leave out the plus, and that means a set of apples is not a subtype of a set of fruit because the subtyping thing doesn't go in the, in the, in the set constructor. So the, the, the subtype relation I have when I write that, but not when I write that. So that's a hurdle to overcome when I do abstract by position. And, but what's interesting is actually that there is a very tight correspondence between abstract by position and abstract by name. And furthermore, that correspondence actually explains what variance is. So it's actually rather nice. So we can model these parameterized types as follows. We can say, well, let's, let's find an encoding where for every parameter I encode that as an abstract member. And for every argument, I encode it as a refinement. So we'll see how that work, works. So where I had before a class set of t with something in there, now I just write a class set unparameterized. But instead of the parameter, I give you a type member. I just write it dollar $t here to say, well, it's not the same thing. It's not the, the name t by itself, but some other name that the compiler generates. OK. And set of string would be the, <coughs> then the type set. But now I have to declare that the type t, the type parameter t, is string. So I just write it right here, type dollar tree, t equals string. So here you could say, well, I can see this as just essentially a sh syntactic sugar, a shorthand form for that. That's rather neat. So let's see how it works with variance. So let's now look at list. So the class list, which is covariant, would be expanded in exactly the same way. But then a list of number would be expanded slightly differently. Because a list of number, I say, well, it's a list. And the type t in the list, it's some type which is a subtype of number. Or otherwise put, a list of fruit would be a, a list where the type t is a subtype of fruit. And that makes a list of apples a subtype of a list of fruit, because apple is a subtype of fruit. So the type t could be apple here, and it would still be correct. So the question is whether I have an equal here or, or uh, upper bounded by. That's the trick that makes variance works, work. And uh, contravariance then would translate into a lower bound here. But that's maybe one step too far to explain here. OK. Good. Uh, number seven and last, uh, I think for, for the essential modularity features in Scala is uh, implicits to keep boilerplate uh, away. So, Keep boilerplate implicit. Implicit parameters are a, the concept that helps you cut quite a lot of boilerplate and get a lot of flexibility in your program. So they're surprisingly versatile. The original use of implicit parameters was essentially as a more modular version of a type class, as you know that in Haskell. So a typical example here is the minimum method that takes that can work for any arguments of type A as long as there is an ordering over this A. So there must be an ordering that explains how to compare elements of type A. And the idea is just you need to get that from somewhere. Uh, uh, and uh, you don't care from where it comes. It just must be unique. There must be one most specific ordering that you could have. And that's done with this implicit here. So you could, of course, have written the ordering explicitly. It could just demand the ordering as a parameter. But it would be very cumbersome to, for every min to have to pass an ordering in this minimal met method. Because probably in most of your program, you deal with the same type. So you're passing the same thing 100 times to your min methods and the other methods. And that's something that you typically want to leave implicit. That's why the parameter is implicit. 
OK, but there are actually other, also other uh, applications that are equally powerful. So implicits can represent a context. So in the compiler, for instance, we have this thing that essentially everything you need to know from anywhere, it's all in this object, which is the context, the context in which you are. In these contexts, they are typically rather stable. They're the same in large parts of programs. But at some points, we say, well, in some specific part, my context would be different. And I, the context would then evolve. So, so it's sort of a tree of contexts that get passed into these things. And again, basically everything needs a context. I could pass it everywhere, but it would be extremely cumbersome. The code would look horrible if every operation would have would need an additional context parameter. A related thing here is uh, a, um, the default options. So that's just a, an argument where uh, normally to the compiler I pass a certain string of options in a testing framework, and that's sort of there's a, there's a default, and I want to override this sometimes. I want to override sometimes the options are different. And there again, uh, implicit parameters are a very useful way to do that. If you take a step back and squint your eyes a little bit, then that's really what dependency injection is. That's things that you sort of have to pass to everything in your program, and you want some control over what it is, uh, but you don't want to have the boilerplate to pass everything everywhere explicitly. So implicit parameters give you dependency injection. They're a very nice way to do that. And finally, implicit parameters also give you capabilities. So here's an operation that says, for instance, access profile of a customer ID. And you can access a profile of a customer only if you have admin rights. So that means for the, uh, the capability uh, to enable access profile, I need to pass my admin rights as an as a additional parameter into this method here. So that's a classical way to do capabilities in an object-oriented way. A capability is just an unforgeable object that I allocate somewhere, and then I pass it to everyone who needs it. And again, it's very, very tedious to do that explicitly because in a situation like that, all that matters is I call somebody's method that needs a capability, and I have it. How this capability then manages to get passed to the point of call is completely irrelevant. I have the capability you need it. I can give it to you. So again, implicit, there's, a, there's a great argument for implicits here. So to uh, conclude with the module part, so I think the, the things that matter here are a rich static type system. Objects give you atomic modules. Classes give you parameterized modules. Traces give you slices of behavior. You can abstract by name or by position, but the two are really sort of codable. You can code abstracting by position into abstracting by name. And you can cut boilerplate with implicit parameters. Again, that for me is sort of the vocabulary that I use every day to write modules in libraries. So in summary, I would say it's a fairly modest, some might even say boring, set of parts that can be combined in rather flexible ways. And the caveat, of course, is always that's, that's my selection. Not everybody needs to agree. Um, before we finish, maybe let me just have a quick slide on the other parts that didn't end up in this list. And there are quite a few of them also in Scala. So here are some things that are not on this list. And they're not on the list because they're either not as simple or they don't work as seamlessly with the core as the other parts that I've, I've given you. So the first one would be implicit conversions. So while I was singing the praises of implicit parameters, the same is not at all true of implicit conversions. Implicit conversions just say, I have a type A, and then under the covers, it gets converted into this type B whenever necessary. Uh, the problem with that is that the more of these things you have, the, the stranger there's the interaction between them. So I guess implicit conversions, they are the seductive thing that it, it starts out great if you have one or two, and then you add three or four or five, and suddenly it doesn't work that great anymore. So it's a slippery slide. So that's why I would say, well, stay away from implicit conversions as much as possible. Uh, second thing is existential types, which are sort of a promise to paper over certain aspects of types, but it uh, typically doesn't work very well with inference and other things. Also, structural types can become very complicated, also inefficient, because they sometimes require reflective access. Higher kinded types, that's something which um, um, I, I think in the end, we need, but we, I would like to, I, I'm a bit frustrated that right now it's not integrated very well with the other types and the, and the uh, type inference in particular. 
higher kind of types don't really have a, a role in this duality of type parameters and type fields that I have shown you. And finally, macros, which of course uh, are uh, an amazingly powerful hammer that can do a lot, but they're also very complicated. So what I should say is that all of these things are under language feature flags or experimental flags. So to enable any of these five things, you need to turn on an explicit option or you need to have an import, import language dot existential, so import, import language dot structural or things like that. So that should make it clear that they are outside the core. You could ask, well, why do we have them if they're outside the core? Well, I think part of the reason is that uh, Scala is really not sort of a uh, monolithic uh, industry uh, company language. A company language, it can work for, for years be behind a wall, and then you throw it over, and they, you, you, you say, that's it, and there's nothing else. Scala is a community project. So a lot of people working on Scala, lots of different ideas. And that's something that means it's much more fluid than a corporate language. And we need to manage this fluidity in one way or the other. So what we have chosen to manage it with is precisely this mechanism to say, well, we let things in, but we label them experimental, or we label them in a special language feature flag, or things like that. And that means that you can, you sort of are warned. You, are, you, you, you have to declare explicitly that you now want this particular piece of the language. So my adv advice actually would be to, if you want to keep things simple, I would avoid these things mostly, unless you have a clear use case. And of course, one of the use cases could be that you want to use Scala as a domain-specific language, as a host for a domain-specific language or another language. And that's a perfectly valid use case. And that then you might find some of these things really essential. But if what you're after is really bright, just some program, some project with just plain, simple Scala, then I would say I've shown you the parts that I think qualify. Thank you. Happy to answer questions. Yeah. One of the things that was hard in learning Scala coming from Java was does it look like Java? Do I try and make it look like Haskell? There's so many ways of doing things, and I'm finding my way. But if I knew a preferred way to go from a Java idiom to a Scala idiom, it was like, well, when you're doing this in Java, try and do this in Scala. That's a preferred way. And there's some of that with fail recursion. But yeah. I didn't find enough. OK, so what's, yeah, what, what is good advice to come over from, let's say, Java to Scala? Because there's a confusing number of different possibilities. You can write it like, uh, like a Java without semicolons, or you can go all the way to simulate Haskell on the JVM. Yeah, um, I, I, I would say to, well, the first advice is keep things as simple as possible. And then I think the, you, you have here the building blocks that you say, well, why I used a loop, uh, then what I would say, well, let's consider first, do I actually have a combinator that does what the loop did? before, like is it a map, is it a filter, is it a fold, and these things you sort of uh, have to learn gradually because there are quite a few of them and you wouldn't of course know initially all of them. But some of them you know and some of them you can apply directly and then your loop has shrunk into a single expression and that's a win. Then the next step would be to say, well, uh, if it's not that, then let me just write a recursive function with the same thing. And that's again, it's sort of a, a, a thing that you have to do a couple of times to get the hang of it, how it works. But uh, once you've got the hang of it, it becomes quite natural. And I think with these things, that's sort of already it. Uh, there's not that much more to do. Uh, you probably want to uh, move statements into expressions. Uh, you want to keep uh, minimize mutable variables and keep them immutable and things like that. The important thing also, I think it is, we have to realize it is a gradual process. So we can't assume that the code will be good the first time. That's just impossible. And it's not just impossible for somebody coming from Java, but I think it's, it's a general situation for all of us. Any time that the code we write after a year, we might have written the code differently. We will be we, learning constantly, and that's good. That's OK. Right? So I think the important thing is not to be afraid to write code that maybe is not perfect. Just write it, and uh, if you come back in a year and want to rewrite it and do it better, then that's also perfectly fine. 
in Tibet. I'm wondering to ask more in terms of like the critical programming that you Okay, first question was, uh, what has Scala to offer for concurrent applications? Uh, it actually has to offer quite a lot. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a very solid and refined set of libraries that deals with concurrency, uh, starting with futures, uh, going to ACA actors, uh, going to reactive streams. I think that we have the right abstractions to deal with that. So you, then you could ask, well, why are there the right abstractions? Why do they make concurrency easier? And I think the answer is precisely that uh, if in a concurrent setting you want to be as immutable as possible because every piece of mutable state has to be protected by a lock and is a piece of liability. So the more things are immutable, the, 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 the better. And then the other thing is you typically need rather sophisticated abstractions and they profit greatly if you can pass a, 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 a function as a parameter. So for instance, if I take futures as a, as a very simple example, so the uh, traditional Java futures, uh, they, they block. So you have a future and then you, you uh, essentially you set up a future uh, which says at some point later on this thing will have a value. There's a thread that uh, computes it at, the, at current. And the consumer then can go to the future and says, well, now I need the future. And at that point I block. Whereas in Scala futures you have this uh, method called oncomplete, which says, well, if I have a future then when the future completes, then call this code, which essentially does the continuation, that continues dealing with the future. And that's this, this sort of reactive approach to, to concurrent software is everywhere. And to make it work well, you really have to have a lot of the functional idioms. So I, we, we were giving a Coursera course that explains that better. It's called Principles of Reactive Programming. It was taught by myself and Eric Meyer, where Eric talked about essentially observables and the futures. Uh, Eric is the one who did uh, Java, Java RX and uh, RX extensions on .NET, so essentially everything reactive. He plays a big hand. And then there was uh, Roland Kuhn who uh, presented ACA and Actress. And I think if you see that course, then you see that really to make reactive do well, you need the functional abstractions because otherwise it's 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 too hard. Uh, the the abstractions are too clumsy, and and you won't do a good job. That was the first answer. The second question was, uh, does Scala run on Android? And the answer is yes, it runs on Android. There's a tool chain that you can use. Uh, I think it's integrated in in the IDEs. Uh, you can on, use Eclipse or IntelliJ and produce Android applications. Yes. Most of this won't have the luxury of starting over from scratch if we want to merge Scala into our existing systems. A lot of us have Java systems. Um, so my question is about the <coughs> frameworks that are going to work with both. I know there's SVT for Scala. Um, I haven't used it that much, so I don't know all its features. I'm looking at Gradle for other reasons. And I'd like to know what the, uh, you know, is there love between those two frameworks? And, and what pressure is there? Um, you mean for build frameworks, SPT and Gradle? Um, can, I, can I do it using the Scala build template? Yeah. Okay. So, the, so there was a question. I think the general question was, uh, how do I um, combine Java and Scala, what libraries and frameworks exist that work with both. And in particular, the question was about build tools. So it's definitely possible to build Scala with Gradle. Uh, the, uh, there's the one thing where for efficiency we have this incremental build, uh, which is essentially uh, currently integrated in SBT, but it's also available in a separate component called Zinc that can be integrated in Gradle and in Maven. So I would say the, the the best incremental build is currently linked tied to SPT, but there is a way to build incrementally that's also available from Gradle and Maven. And uh, 
we, we would like to make that more widely available, so even, even the, 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 the best incremental build for the other builders. I mean, definitely we are not, I think the Scala community as a whole and TypeSafe in particular is definitely not of the position to say it should be SPT and nothing else. If you want to build with Maven and Gradle, that's perfectly, perfectly good as well. We're very agnostic there. Uh, in the other frameworks, it's very similar. So what TypeSafe does, uh, the, uh, the ACA framework and the Play framework, they're both essentially dual usage. So they have a Java API and they have a Scala API. And uh, with Java 8, we're actually very excited because we think that we can, Java 8 will help us get the Java a APIs, imp to improve the Java APIs and get them up to the level where the Scala APIs are. So that's definitely a, a program that we have that we want to be useful for Java as well as Scala, Scala clients. Uh, yes? And afterwards. Sorry. Yeah, first, first you and then. I just work on improving compiler speed. Is there something these developers can do to help the compiler concept? Um, yeah, so talking about compiler speed, so we, I, we did try to improve it, but what can we do now to essentially <coughs> get faster builds? So it's interesting to see why, why are the builds so relatively slow. So first the question is how slow are they? Uh, what, what I get typically uh, on, an, on the MacBook Pro and on an iMac is somewhere between 500 and maybe 1,000 lines a second. That's sort of what I'm, what I'm, what I'm getting when I do a clean compile. And um, <clears throat> that's not super, super slow, but it's definitely not as fast as, let's say, Java that gets in the tens of thousands of lines of seconds. So, so why is there this difference in speed? So the problem is there's several factors that all multiply with each other. It's not just additive, it's multiplicative. The first factor there is is that type inference is costly. So type inference uh, means that the compiler has at some point to do a search, in particular implicits. So it might search many things which then don't pan out, and that's, that's wasted work and that's, that's reduced work. So to help the compiler along, generally, the more types you annotate, the better, because that means that the, the compiler doesn't have to figure them out. And also, uh, the fewer implicits you have in scope, the better. So if you have a lot of implicits visible in a lot of things, then that's generally bad because the compiler has to search them all. So that's sort of a hint what to do there. Uh, the, the other thing that uh, costs a speed is that the Scala compiler has to go through a large sequence of transformations, which all lead again to type trees. And while it does these transformations, the code becomes a lot bigger. And that has in particular to do with, uh, with, with uh, function values, with lambdas, because currently each lambda gets translated into an inner class, and the inner class then gets translated into a top-level class because the JVM doesn't know inner classes. And there's a, a lot of duplication then in all these classes, both for the code generation and internally for the type checking. So that means that at the end, the Scala program is much bigger and it's slower to type check, so then, yeah, of course, there's a lot of time that the compiler takes to go through that. Hopefully, oh, uh, fortunately, that actually that part actually will improve. Uh, uh, the next version of Scala will target Java 8, and Java 8 has lambdas, so we don't need to generate these inner classes anymore for all the closures that we have. In fact, that's that will be done at, at program uh, load time, uh, because the JVM uh, JDK 8 will actually generate these lambda classes with, with invoke dynamic when the program starts. So the compiler doesn't have to generate them anymore. And that should definitely help keeping the whole code size smaller and therefore also keeping uh, increasing the speed of the compiler. Yes? Yeah. So I came to Scala World from the C-sharp world and I wanted to know what they think about F-sharp. So I see F-sharp as a competitor to uh, Scala in some sense. So where are they? Okay. So difference uh, or similarities between Scala and F sharp. So uh, Scala and F sharp are indeed quite have have quite similar roles. Uh, they, we are sort of on different platforms. F sharp is on .NET. We are on the JVM. Uh, I, I'm very good friends with Don Syme, the creator of F sharp. We actually had quite a few discussions, and uh, some some of the developments are, have been actually quite parallel. For instance. Uh, in uh, around 2006 or seven, Scala had a thing called extractors, which is essentially ex extensible pattern matching. And F Sharp had active patterns, which was a version, which, which, which is a variant of that, which is very close to what we have in extractors. So some of the things actually, there was sort of cross-pollination between Scala and F Sharp. Uh, 
in the general outlook, I think there is some difference. Uh, I've said Scala is a modular language, and part of the modular genes come from object orientation. We talk about objects, classes, traits, and it innovates a lot in that space. Whereas F sharp is traditionally a functional language in the ML style, so essentially an OCaml, but the modules got removed and the .NET object system just got integrated directly lock, stock, and barrel. So the F sharp idea was we, let's, let us take a functional language and let's take just the objects of the host platform because we don't care about objects and, and make that work. So that's sort of the difference in Outlook why some people say more Scala is a language that comes from object oriented programming and adds functional programming, and F sharp is a little bit the, the opposite. But we, we, we meet somewhere pretty close in the middle, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you were asking, yeah. So we can have the option of Scala, which um, might not be as well advertised, with regard to type safety. So one of the other sold, maybe not as advertised, is the actor system in Scala, which is actually inherently type less. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit about? So why is the actor system typeless? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the so maybe one if I go go back uh, to this slide here that explains it a little bit. Uh, yeah, this one here. So the the type system of Scala actually is not so much about to capture a lot of properties with types. It's more about to say, well, uh, we don't want to be embarrassed towards the people in Clojure anymore, how clunky our type system is, how clunky our types are. So the, so the types, so a Clojure guy would typically say, I would never program in a language like Java because the types are horrible. So, <laughs> so the, 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 the main purpose of Scala types was we want types that don't suck. Right, so we don't do types that, that we can we can defend towards towards a dynamic type to the dynamic guy. For the moment, not necessarily to capture a lot of properties. That's actually what I think might happen in the future. We might be able to actually move this a little bit over there to capture things like effects. I don't think we'll do it with monads. I think there's some things that still wait to be invented, but I have high hopes that actually there will be movements over the next years towards that goal. But I would say. Scala is a fairly conser conservative language which says, well, we want types that don't suck and we don't really want to go all the way over here where these things might become very complicated and complicated and a pain in the butt of the developers. For the actors now, the point with the actors is that an actor, you send messages to an actor, but you send more than one. So you, you send different kinds of messages. It's not always the same. The messages have different types. Uh, you could, of course, say, well, create an algebraic type or a class hierarchy that, that, that defines the messages and send them. And maybe that would, would have been the right thing. But it's probably very hard to do that because different actors at different times take different messages. So the type system would be an overhead, but it still wouldn't be very accurate. You can go further, and that would be then really interesting to say, well, what I actually want is more that the uh, types give me the protocol of the actor. For instance, you could say the actor always expects first a message of this kind and then a message of that, that, that kind. And it will, or it will always respond with an act uh, if, if there is a, is, is, is a certain request or things like that. And these type systems exist also. They're called session types. They're very interesting, but they're so far quite, quite uh, experimental and researchy. So again, that's sort of something where we consciously said, well, let's do the safe thing. Let's do essentially have untyped actors because we don't really know what a good type system for them is yet. And the other part, the, the other reason why that works actually pretty well is that because of the way we treat pattern matching in, in Scala, patterns recover the types. So you can put in an any or an object in the message, and you, then you say, well, uh, let, let me match uh, whether it's some this, this message constructor and that message constructor. If the match succeeds, I know exactly what the type is. So in that sense, this sort of small amount of dynamic typing from the message that comes into the patterns is uh, it definitely, I mean, there is, there is, you, you, you might want to tighten that up. But for me, it's not super urgent. And that's, that's why sort of the, the, the compromise was, let's do it as an Erlang treat them dynamically. Or, uh, we have some questions for the live stream. Maybe OK, great. Questions. Yeah, let's <coughs> switch to the live stream. Sure. Uh, the first question is from Ted Fujimoto. Uh, how rigorous are the evaluations used to decide user-friendly changes to Scala? 
how rigorous are the evaluations. Oh, well, it's a community process. So uh, that means that if we have uh, proposed a change to Scala, then uh, it gets proposed on the mailing lists. And I would invite every one of you to contribute on these mailing lists. Uh, there's a more formal process with the Scala improvement process. That means there's a mailing list for that. And then at some point, if it's something bigger, then there's a Scala improvement proposal. And that gets discussed at length. And then there's a, there's a jury that votes on that one. Uh, but uh, there is no, we don't do formal usability studies or anything like that. So I don't think we have the bandwidth for that. So essentially, what we need to do is we need to rely on taste and user feedback. Coherence is a whole point of type classes. Why would giving that up for modularity be anything like a sensible idea? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Brian. <laughs> uh, yeah, I heard that argument from Edward Kmet. Uh, the OK, the, the question was, coherence is the whole essence of type classes. Why would giving that up for modularity be sensible? So what coherence means? Uh, is precisely the thing that for a given type class, I have one and only one possible implementation of the type class, which is anti-modular because one and only one is, uh, means it's a global namespace. So why is that a reasonable thing to do? So I think it's precisely because if you need coherence, then you can work around it. So what I would do with coherence, I would put the thing, uh, essentially the type class and its usages into an enclosing object, and that could, could be made to work. I um, have seen the argument from Edward Met, and I would like to really have the time or to meet him sometimes and discuss that with him, because I think it's a, it's a straw man. It's a thing that you can easily work around. For instance, by saying with the ordering argument, I would just say to say, well, I, let me have an ordering object that contains this ordering, and it is this object. And then everybody else has to implicitly depend on this ordering. I have to uh, essentially parameterize my system with that ordering. And Scala has a lot of parameterization methods. I've shown you the abstract types and the abstract fields in, in classes that, that, that let, let you do that. So I think it's not necessarily a conflict between the two. But of course, you have to acknowledge the fact that in a modular system, you can't have a priori a globally unique instance. So you have to arrange things that that's what you get. Um, is Dottie going to be uh, is Dottie going to be the next Scala compiler, or will it remain as an experimental thing? Is Dottie going to be the next Scala compiler, or will it be experimental? Um, it's currently too early to tell. Uh, I actually have. Um, I'm pretty confident that it will. F most of the Dottie ideas will find their way into the Scala code base. Uh, uh, in what form? Whether. Essentially, they will be selectively backported into the Scala C base, or at some point we'll switch over. I think it's it's too early to tell. But I would say most of the uh, of the ideas, both in compiler design and in language design of Dottie, will will find their way into Scala. I think that so far, that I'm I'm confident by now, so far from what what we've seen so far, that that will be the case. Uh, I haven't seen enough of that. And I, I, I guess the, it could be, in principle, yes. But I don't, before I say, so, say something with a precise opinion, I would have to know the word remover better. So don't nail me down to something. But definitely, the idea of having a lint tool or a style checker is something that is very good, that is very important in this whole context. And that's actually something we're working on. So. In the 2.12 uh, time frame, what we want to come out is a lint tool uh, that uh, essentially does a style check of the code and uh, sniffs out some other uh, code smells. And what's also important is that this lint tool should be configurable, so that you should add your, be able to add your own rules or remove selective rules that you think shouldn't apply to your code base. So I think that's, that will be, once, once we have that, that will be a very important contribution. And water remover is sort of one of the prototypes we look at here. I have a question about the Scala community. So uh, we did a panel on Scala in 2018 with Rod Johnson following his keynote. 
and we had five uh, voices from Scala community ranging from kind of mild to spicy, uh, and <laughs> in terms of functional, and uh, so Jorge Ortiz, uh, then of course we are now at uh, Stripe, he came up with this idea of Scala tribes, right? So essentially Scala is leads to tribes, so there is a Twitter tribe which is middle of the road, there is a beginning tribe which is Java converts, and there is kind of a P extreme uh, tribe which which basically is like crypto hostlers uh, using kind of Scala, you know, where they prefer Haskell. All right, so question first, like community question, how do we keep this community together? What are your tips to keep the community together? And so second question is practical. Let's say you're a review of engineering. There is a lot of uh, reviews of engineering and CTOs in this meetup, and uh, there's one of them, I don't know if you've had this situation, but let's say you have two employees, right? One is kind of new convert, he uses lots of bars, and he doesn't see the point of valves and things. And the other is kind of a Haskell guy who you know works in Scala, and he really wants to move it all the way to Haskell, so the new guy does a commit with a var, and the, the Haskell guy cancels it, right? So the Haskell guy will not allow any bars into the code base. The, the newbie guy doesn't understand why he can't have his counter for global objects, right? So how do you, first of all, as a kind of manager, uh, manage this in reality? And secondly, how do we keep these tribes from splitting apart in, in the community? Yeah. yeah, okay. So the question was, uh, we have all these tribes, how you manage to keep them from splitting apart, how do you manage disagreements between the different dialects that we have on top of Scala? I think that my talk sort of tried to address that in, to some degree. To the, I said, well, first we have this aspect of a growable language that sprouts all sort of, sorts of dialects, and that those are your tribes. And uh, we just have to be clear to say, well, what is the core of Scala and what are the dialects? And uh, I also tried to contribute here in the talk just to identify, to nail down what the core of Scala is. Now, that doesn't mean that you, it must be your choice to say it's the same core of Scala. Any team could decide to say, well, we want Scala plus X, and uh, that's just our uh, version. Or we want Scala minus X, that's our version. So everybody is free to do that. But if you want guidance from, from me, then that's that, uh, in, in that talk, that's the guidance I gave you. course on Coursera and shortly afterwards tried to challenge myself uh, by uh, taking a follow on algorithms and analysis course and I you know made the resolution that I was going to do every single assignment uh, while holding true the to, to, to the core tenet of immutability and uh, you know write everything using Scala for that assignment for every single algorithm and I realized that you know the years of training that I've had uh, with all the algorithms that have been taught to me as uh, you know being imperative where you know, if you're trying to find the minimum cut of a graph with a, a million nodes, then it's pretty hard to do that without giving up, giving up some of those core tenets that you learn uh, when you first learn functional programming. So I was wondering if you have any insights to share on, is there a class of problems uh, that functional programming in, is inherently not good for? Okay. Uh, what is that class of problems and what is functional programming good for? Okay, so the question was, uh, so the situation was that uh, you um, d took a class in algorithms and wanted to write all the algorithms immutable in an immutable fashion and found out that sometimes it's very difficult to do so. Uh, for instance, uh, to do a minimum cut of a graph of a million nodes. And the question is, is functional programming not suitable for certain kinds of applications? So the first thing to say, uh, we actually have a a paper at, in communications of the ACM, uh, which is uh, about Scala, and the examples are all about graphs. It's not minimum cut, cut, uh, cut, it's topological sort, but still it should give you some inspiration how to go about that. So if you look at that, then what you will see is that actually we don't shy away from using mutable state. And in fact, Scala is not about shying away from mutable state. It's about encapsulating the state. So what I mean by encapsulation is not the object-oriented form where I say, well, I give you a getter and setter instead of a var, then you still have the var. <laughs> right? That's not. It's really to have state that is not visible for the application. That's just there as a way to be more more performant. So, for instance, your minimum cut. If your minimum cut did, a, did an imperative traversal of the graph, but it wouldn't modify the graph, and the, res the result is just essentially a list of nodes that's the minimum cut. I don't care whether you use mutable state internally or you don't. 
What I do care about is that as systems grow in your interfaces of the components, you should minimize mutable state because we know that's a liability. That's anti-modular, that's very difficult to deal with. So that in the examples I gave you with the compiler were in the same vein. I'm actually quite proud of the mutable state I use in the compiler and how clever it gets hidden so that it just increases performance and uh, essentially I don't, I don't pollute my interfaces with mutable state. That for me is an achievement if you can, can do that. Now to get there, it's true that if you come from imperative programming, to get there it's actually good to have sort of a, a period of, of, of discipline and fasting and say well I want to really force myself to be purely functional for a while. Because only afterwards, maybe, then I can feast on meat again and drink alcohol or whatever. <laughs> so, 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 and, and that's, that's, a good, that's, a, that's a good school. That's good discipline. But I would say, well, and, it, and definitely it's also very interesting to see what can we do in the implementation of these functional algorithms that they remain, uh, that, that the implementation is purely functional. But it's not an end in itself. So to, to say, well, sometimes we have to admit it's harder or it's less efficient to do it purely functional than imperative, and that's also OK. Can we nail it down what's really harder purely uh, in, in, in functional than imperative? That's difficult because essentially I would have said a while ago, well, anything with essentially graph problems, but actually the functional guys keep inventing new, new uh, abstractions that turn out to be extremely hand, hand, handy. So for the graph problems, for instance, there's this concept of lenses that actually lets you mutate, in quotes, a graph in a purely functional way. And that's essentially a library of lenses. So but you have to sort of learn that and know about that. It's, a, it's another concept. So I don't think I want to make it tie it down to some set of things where I say, well, no, this uh, imperative will always be better for that. It's a moving target. We have time for two more questions, so make it fast. Uh, maybe one from the back. Yep. So word on the street is that you're not necessarily a fan of the idea of sort of Haskellizing Scala with things like Scala Z. So I just want to know your thoughts on libraries like that and shapeless things as well. Um, Haskellizing Scala with Scala Z and Shapeless. Um, yeah, well, for me, that's is essentially that's a dialect. So I personally haven't found occasion to use it a lot for the stuff I do, uh, but uh, that might be just the stuff I do. So I can't really talk about. Uh, and I've, 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 there are many people I respect a lot that use it to great effect. So I, I can only say, well, some people use Scala Z and Shapeless and do great stuff with it, and other people. Uh, haven't found a lot of usage for that, and I think we what what, what we, we should, it would be good to make have a, maybe at some point an analysis to say where does it help and where do do we find not a lot of usage for it. Uh, but uh, it's difficult to say really. Right now, that's that's all I can say. Last question. Yes. I think the REPL and the um, worksheet was really helpful in learning the material and learning learning Scala. Um, what can you say about the future of the debugability of the language? Is part of the Introduction of lambdas in the Java language going to improve how debuggable the Scala is going to be because stepping for the debuggers a little bit challenging right now. What what debugger are you using for Scala? Uh, the one from the course I just found that Twitter called the Eclipse. Eclipse, the Eclipse debugger. So debuggability, actually, um, I'm not exactly sure what version that is. Uh, but uh, we have, had, have been working on the debugger, and I think in particular the stepability has improved a lot. So maybe, maybe that's already addressed. Um, I'm not sure whether lambdas will help, because in the end, they, essentially, the code with lambdas will, in the end, be very, very close to the code that we have now, only will be generated at load time rather than at compile time. But that shouldn't affect the debugger. Um, one thing that I personally find quite exciting that we are currently uh, looking into is uh, asynchronous debugging. So that means that if you have a reactive system with threads, uh, with, with, uh, with, with events, then typically your call stacks give you very little information. They tell you almost nothing. So what you really need, want to know that if you have uh, something happening, well, it got prompted by a message. So who sent that message? And what was, it, was the situation at the caller and at the caller of that caller? But then you sort of hop between threads. So it would be very nice to have that as a debug view. And we're currently looking into what we can do there. Good. Thank you all for the questions. <laughs>